and good morning. Uh, thank you for running through the books thing. If any, I think I, I just really want to unload the books. I don't need to carry them around. Those folks who aren't here, of course, I'm going to have to find. They have to need to come by or have to mail them or somehow get them. So it's really a, it's really, really, really a uh, help to have you pick them up. Again, to our, just to explain some things here, the textbook, of course, you all will need to have access to. Uh, this is a wonderful book. This is an expensive book, but it's a wonderful book. This is in a second edition. Some of you have the first edition. And, and the textbook is key to the first edition. And, and, and they add, actually, the first edition is missing one paragraph, I guess. Uh, but he added questions and he updated the bibliography. That's, so it really isn't any substantive change other than the one paragraph, which I, I read was no big deal. Uh, so one of the handouts on the sheet up here was this light, on the table here is this light tan. Uh, that has, that has the, the, the differences between the textbook page numbers, both for this book, if you have the first edition, and Bolt, remember Bolt? Okay, next year is Old Testament again. So I, I gave you a sheet like that the very first year because again, the textbook was last edited like 2007 or eight or nine, and these, these books were re-edited or republished in the last 10 years, okay? So, so textbook, one or the other edition of this book by Leclerc, this little commentary, and this book, and this is also called The Prophets. It's also a kind of a commentary. This is an old book, though. This is uh, Abraham Heschel. Maybe that name means something to you. Uh, uh, he died in the 70s, I think. This is a book that was published in the 1950s based on his doctoral work that he did in the 20s and 30s. So it's a kind of a classic. And um, I bought these all used. So some, some might say used, they might have a mark on the end. A few of you, uh, they have some, a couple of them had markings. Like you know, when you buy a used book on Amazon, you don't know what you're getting. And, and so when you, when you pay me, when you pay the Bible school, you'll see on the, 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 book, sh the book list, it says used type A or used type B. <laughs> Use type B are the books that have markings in, and there were only four of them. I'm challenging to be honest. I say, okay. so, uh, so, but the rest, of the, but they're all used. So a new book would be twenty bucks. The, the the good clean one, relatively clean ones are thirteen dollars now, and the ones with the markings are five bucks less. So that explains that. Okay. Um, I don't need your money today uh, if you want to get rid of it because you're afraid you're going to die or you're going to be, that's kind of some people saying that, and, and they want to make sure they, that we have their funeral. Uh, or if um, just, yeah, you just need to do it, I'll take the money, put it in the basket up here. Uh, what you have up here, by the way, is I would invite you during the break, you, you have, again, the folders with homework. We have the year two te tests. I have the year unit one tests for some of you who didn't pick it up yet. Handouts. Uh, and then this, this chart. <laughs> this chart, I'll speak about more during class. It is a putting on paper of the vision, visions of a man named Charles Miller who read, who, who read Revelation literally. And, and you'll get to see some sense of how he associated. He's a, and he predicted that the world was going to end. Jesus was going to come back in 1842. Didn't happen, of course. Then he recalculated. All very mathematical. He recalculated. Said, ah, I was off. It's 1843. And again, of course, he was wrong. Now, you might think, being wrong twice, all his... Followers would just disband, but they didn't. They were quite moved by him and by his preaching. And so they continued to exist as the Church of the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay? So they're meeting this morning, the Seventh-day. They worship on Saturday. 
Okay, they read the Bible in a very literal way, and they they hold that even though we're Christian, we're bound we're bound to um, to worship on the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath, uh, and they they're literal readers of the Bible, and they see the Pope as the Antichrist. So when you look at the chart, look at how many times it says it says Catholic Rome. Catholic Rome is the Antichrist. So you get a sense of, of the, just if you've met people or you've heard of people like that, this is an example. Seventh day Adventists, by the way, have broken and, and split and broken and split. So they're really a, a whole variety of kinds of, of Adventists. They're, the Advent, that word means coming, huh? They expect Jesus is coming soon, soon, any moment now, actually 150 years ago. Um, so that's where that. Adventism, Adventism is a movement within Christianity that ba is based on Charles Miller's original predictions and uh, still exists in the church. And one aspect of it is they really, I mean, if they can get a Catholic to come see the light, they get triple points. I mean, they really, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal for them. So anyway, okay, a word of prayer and then we'll start. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we greet you on this Sabbath morning. Uh, throughout the world, the Jewish community uh, rests on this Sabbath day. We, we will hold off till tomorrow. We're here to work today. <laughs> and we ask your blessings on this group of sturdy students who have, will come to the end of a second year of study. Bless them, reward them for their desire to know you better through your word. For if they know you better through their word, then they can love you better. Uh, help us make this a good day for us all. Uh, teaching and learning and, and camaraderie uh, before we take a long needed uh, break for summer. Um, our nation is beginning to come out of hiding uh, after uh, months and months of of restrictions under COVID. Uh, keep blessed that progress we make. Bless us that we haven't rushed things along as we begin to, to, to come out of, uh, of that uh, past and uh, help keep the world healthy and help us help the world be healthy. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So there are some of you who have begged to take the test right away which makes no sense to me. We're gonna, Cause maybe you'll do better after we talk about the, the, court, the text. Maybe, just maybe, maybe. So we're going to work through the lessons as we normally would. And the examorama will be at the end of the day. It's on unit three. It's just on the Gospel of John and apocalyptic writing and revelation. And I suspect you'll just be so full of insight after the lectures that you will just ace this sucker. <laughs> Okay. Any questions before we start? There are few writings in all of literature that have been so obsessively read with such disastrous results as the book of Revelation. The cause of this, uh, as I spoke last time when we introduced the, uh, the idea of apocalypticism, is that some people have understood the opening phrase in, in the first verse to be taken literally as Jesus talks about that I'm going to tell you what is going to happen very soon. And so that very soon, and, and people who've read it as a kind of a countdown prediction has led, I think, to a great deal of, of, of chaos and unhappiness and hatred, uh, and, and made the book kind of difficult. Martin Luther did not like Revelation. He, if he could have done it, he would have not included it in the Bible. He also felt that way about the letter of James and the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, he said, they have nothing of Christ in them, he said. And, and, and having read it now and studied it, you maybe get a sense of where Luther was coming from. No, there's nothing about grace and, and, and justification and, and our sins being forgiven and love your neighbor. Instead, it's, it's anger and tension and 
destruction and judgment. And, and so, again, Mel Martin did translate it in his German Bible, but he made, he made it very clear that he, he, that he really didn't find much of Jesus in it. Apocalypticism speaks to the tension between our experience and our convictions. You know, what we think the world should be and how it is. You, you see it also in marriage, you know. When we get married, we have a very romantic vision of marriage. And there's the reality. What do you do about that? When there's a gap between your convictions and the, your experience. Do you remember when we read the book of Deuteronomy? There's what, what I called the Deuteronomic Principle. Uh, it's like, you do good. <laughs> you do good, and God will do good for you. You do bad, and they'll be bad that God has in mind for you. Let me actually just read Deuteronomy 6, 18, which is one of any number of verses that I could use to footnote this principle. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers. So if you do well, God will do well for you. But that doesn't always happen. What, and, and in the early Christian community, the early church met opposition, in some cases overt persecution. How do you fit together the pledge from Deuteronomy that if you do good for God, God will be good for you, and the reality of persecution? One way of responding to it is in apocalyptic. That is, I mean, yeah, the word apocalypsus means to unveil, but with a capital A, apocalyptic is, a, is, a, is our scholarly way of putting our arms around not just this book, but a whole library of literature, predominantly Jewish, some of it Christian, that responds to that gap between the world as God has promised it would be and how we experience it. And apocalyptic handles that gap by dividing the present age with the age to come. Now again, they're not necessarily saying heaven and earth, but the, the present age and the age to come with God's intervention coming in between, that God is going to step into history in a dramatic way. Apocalyptic answers the need for an alternative view of the present, one in which God's presence is included and is about to transform the things about the, our environment that we're not so happy with, that God is going to come and remake it into a shape that can only now be imagined. I'm going to use this phrase a couple of times at the beginning and at the end. I, I took a course on this kind of literature, and the title of the course was not Apocalyptic or Book of Revelation. It was called Literature of Resistance. And it included not just Revelation, it included Daniel, it included the books of Maccabees of the Old Testament. We'll read Daniel, I think this next year, um, we read Maccabees the fourth year. But there's, there's a whole library of these kinds of apocalyptic texts. And again, why literature of resistance? Well, because, again, what they all share in common is an unhappiness with life as it is. That there are people in charge who shouldn't be in charge. There are forces that control that shouldn't be, in God's name, shouldn't be controlling things. And so, and, and we know that we can't, we can't, we've been unable to, to effect the change we want to. So we're saying, God, come on down, step in, and make it right. Okay? So it's a way of responding when you are a minority, and when, for, yeah, whether it's economic or, or religious persecution or whatever, it's a way of responding to that gap between what 
your faith has promised you and how things are looking. There are other ways of handling it. This is just one way. It has, therefore, a twofold purpose. And when I say this, I mean all this kind of literature, and Revelation in particular, first, to strengthen the faith of God's people, to enable them to continue to resist, not surrender, not give in. Okay, that's number one. To strengthen the faith of God's people, to enable them to resist, and number two, therefore, to provide consolation and hope. I, 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 most Mr. Miller and the people who read the Revelation like him use it to scare people to Jesus. And I would argue that Revelation isn't about scaring people to Jesus. It's about having confidence and hope in living when you live in an environment that does not share your values. Okay? And that's why this book is evergreen. It's eternally appropriate. It's, and I will, you, I mean, I said it last time, and I'm going to say it 87 different ways today. It's not about a countdown and, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence. Well, this means that, and, you know, this is FDR, and, and this is the Suez Canal crisis. And, you know, that's what people have done. That's, that's, that's your morning, early Sunday morning TV evangelism uh, A.M. late at night, uh, you know, uh, preaching from that you get in on the way, A.M. dial. That's what they're seeing. They've been doing that for centuries, and it hasn't happened yet. Well, they make a mistake. They have made, I think, the, the, the fundamental mistake of reading Revelation not as a book for all times, but as a book for the future, that someday this is all going to happen. And I'm, I want to put Revelation in its bigger context because there's a lot of other stuff like it. And I brought again, I haven't opened it, I'm going to read from it, but this is, this is a collection, this is a collection of Jew, mainly Jewish uh, apocalyptic writings apart from Revelation. So again, as Christians, we tend to think this is one, one and only. No, no. This is unique, though, and it's different than those books. Oh, my gosh. Those are so tedious and boring and not, and, and not germane to us as faith. This is a book of faith. This is a book of faith. Okay? And it's, it's meant to encourage and give us hope and help us resist the forces that seem to be in charge around here but don't seem to be reflecting what God has wanted. Who is the author of Revelation? Well, it's obvious. It's John. And you know what? It is John. But who is John? Again, we all assume, not thinking, it's, it's John the Apostle who authored the Gospel and the letters. Well, this is the one, this is the only book that, of, the, of those, the, of the Gospel and the letters, that does in fact identify its author inside, inside the text. He says, I, John. Okay, So we know that is the author's name. But um, it was already in the second century, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus identified this John with John, the son of Zebedee. There are a couple connections. Both of them, both John's Gospel and Book of Revelation, talk about Jesus as the Lamb. Use that image of Lamb. Problem with that is they use different words for it. You would think if it was the same guy, he'd use the same word for it. And, um, and so, and there are similar, a couple other phrases, living water is referred to in both texts. And, and so there's some kind of maybe connection in a broad sense. But you're going to hear me call him the elder. The elder. Uh, that's, that is, uh, that's what tradition has called him. They don't call him the apostle. We don't know he's... He does not identify himself as the apostle, but um, we call him the elder or the seer, S-E-E-R, one who has visions, okay, a seer, right? Uh, the best summary that we can say is he's an otherwise 
unknown Jewish Christian prophet who was highly, highly regarded in the Christian community in the province of Asia, which is Western Turkey. He's, he's a figure of power and, and authority that he can write this message and send letters in Jesus' name and expect that they're going to be read. When? Uh, we have, again here, we have ra rare, but we have general scholarly agreement that what the early fathers said about this book correspond to the internal evidence that it was written in the last decades of the first Christian century under the reign of the emperor Domitian. What's some internal arguments for that? Well, notice at the end, the apostles are very highly revered. Uh, in, in the vision of, of chapter 21, the heavenly Jerusalem is built on a foundation, stones that are named after the apostles. So remember how Mark dealt with the apostles? Okay, a little more time has passed. And, and in this church, the apostles are viewed very highly. Uh, I, I'm going to make, we get to chapter 13, uh, the big reveal, but if you, if you were able to, to read that far in Kester, the, the, the beast, whose number is 666, is likely the emperor Nero, who is dead, but is coming back, according to the text. He was, he is not, and will be again. Nero committed suicide 66 AD. So it's after that. Third, Babylon is used a lot, huh? Is it as a to describe things that are going on. And Babylon was, among Jewish people, a, a figure, a code name for Rome. Let me give you a New Testament example of that. First uh, Peter. Uh, chapter 5, it ends this way. I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Now, Peter, remember Peter, the association when we read Mark, Peter's associated with his dying to, in Rome. Mark, that was one of the arguments I made for the author who Mark was. Mark is this companion of Peter. And, and so I am a, I'm a, a believer that Mark, that Peter wrote and Mark, or Peter preached and Mark wrote in Rome. But why would Babylon, why would Babylon be a fit symbolic name for Rome. What, what did Babylon do that Rome does? Destroy the temple. Remember from year one? Remember? It was the Babylonians who that, that sacked Jerusalem in 587, destroyed the temple, and sent the Jews in exile. Huh? And in every year, the Jewish, Jewish people in the summer celebrate, celebrate a feast day commemorating that. It's a day of fasting. They, they still commemorate the destruction of the first temple. And then in the year 70, the Romans did the same thing. Uh, after a couple years of war, of, of, of siege, they were able to take possession of the Temple Mount and they, and they dismembered the temple block by block. So Rome is a, a name you can and mock and hide under the name Babylon. In that book on the table of the, of the other apocalyptic writings, 2nd Esdras 3, the 2nd Apocalypse of Baruch 10, the Sibyl and Oracles 5, similarly use Babylon as an image to ridicule Rome. So, there is reference in the book to one Christian who dies. His name is Antipas. But there is not references to like hundreds and hundreds of Christians dying. So it seems that while persecution is threatening like today's rain clouds, it hasn't totally broken out in Asia Minor. 
So that's the internal evidence that it corresponds to the patristic authors saying that this was written in the 80s or 90s uh, of the first century. Purpose. Um, if you have, oopsie, oopsie doodle. Uh, if you picked up last time or, or today, this yellow, bright yellow uh, worksheet, not worksheet, but handout. Again, under number one, under 10 things about the book of Revelation, to make it a friend, the, the first one is a heavily academic definition of apocalyptic, but let's look to, to talk about the purpose again. I've already mentioned it once, but to talk about the purpose again, let's take this definition and break it into parts, okay? What is its purpose? First, it's a type of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which an otherworldly being mediates a revelation to a human recipient. That's its genre, that's its kind. That, that's, the, that's what holds Book of Revelation and Daniel and all the writings on that open book on the table there together. It's a narrative where a heavenly being mediates a message about heavenly spiritual things, okay? That's its kind. What is it, context? The, what's, the, what's the message about? It's a message of end time salvation. It's, a, it's about God entering in to heal things, invoking and inviting a new super, a supernatural world, okay? So that's the next, that's also part of that definition. That's its context. And what does it function? How does it achieve its purpose? To interpret present earthly circumstances in light of that supernatural world of the future or of another place, like in heaven. So to influence the understanding and behavior of the present audience. Okay? All of that is kind of built into that, into that definition. So it is, again, as I've said, to comfort and encourage Christians facing imminent persecution, to assure readers of God's intervention, to oppose their enemies, and to warn against all manner of complacency and assimilation. What sets the New Testament book of Revelation apart from all the volumes in, or other writings in that volume over there is its artistry, it's, it's, a, of a whole, it's a whole different level of quality. It's combination of both journeying to heaven and counting down time. I, in the definition, number one, apocalypses are usually one or the other. Either the heavenly messenger takes you on a journey to see things, or it tells you about what the future will be. But Revelation does both of those. That's kind of different. But of course, the most distinctive change is the book is all about the person of Jesus. Jesus is not mentioned in the other books. There's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no anybody like Jesus in the other, uh, the other apocalypses. It's through Jesus that triumph is going to come and evil is going to be overthrown. And that we already experience in heaven. We're going to go back and forth today in reading. It's like a two-level universe. On earth, things are mayhem and mess and destruction. And, but in heaven, everything is neat and tidy and orderly. Everybody sings in heaven. That, that's a sign of harmony. So, right, and that's happening right now. And as I've, some of you heard me say this before, in Revelation, it's not about us going to heaven, is it? It's about heaven coming to us. At the end of the last chapters, the heavenly Jerusalem comes down to earth. So the order, the, the, the harmony, the beauty of God's universe comes down to earth to bring that to the former chaos of our world. That's the ultimately most hopeful thing. So it's not how we get to heaven, which is again how you know, many, many interpreters see this, you know, the whole rapture thing. By the way, rapture isn't in the book, is it? Huh? Antichrist isn't in the book, is it? That's all stuff that's been kind of jammed together. A little bit from here, a little bit from there, 
and they've come out with a whole different package. So I, I want you to be careful about don't let don't don't let us impose that on the text. We're going to let John the seer as best we can explain what he wants to tell us. Structure. How is it organized? Oh my gosh. There's just so many different ways of looking at that. The way I'm going to promote, and you saw it in Kester, is that, you know, again, people like Charles Miller see the work as linear. You know, it's about the future. It's about, the, you know, it's about October. Miller thought it was October 24th, 1843. He added the date even, huh? not just the year. So, because he saw the book as taking us to this linearly. Some early commentators, and this is what I favor, see it as cyclical. Round and round and round and round and round. So that's why it's so darn repetitive. It's a very long book, isn't it? But there's not a lot of drama, there's not a lot of, I mean, it's the same thing. Over and over and over and over and over. Um, my, my example of that is, what's the, uh, the film series, this is written down here, because I never remember it, I'm not a big film uh, person, but um, uh, yeah. Governor, what was that comment? You said Terminator is one of Oh, Terminator, that's it, that's the, that's the, that's the, the Terminator film, I only watched one of them. Okay, remember Terminator, this being from the future comes back, and then they send the Terminator back, because they're having this combat. And you know, every time that the governor Schwarzenegger destroys the, the, the other being, it, it reconstitutes itself. So he fights the same creature over and over and over. But there's really very little, there's not a whole lot of substance to the story. I mean, that's it, isn't it? It's an hour and 50 minutes of you know, smash, bang, destroy, come back, okay? <laughs> So, so, and so the, the, there, is, there you have this cyclical kind of pattern, and I would propose to you that that's the most helpful way. Again, it, 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 if, if you, if you want to say it's about the future, well, then you're going to see it as linear. And you're going to join the zillions of people in the last thousand years who have done that. But, you know, it didn't work for them, ultimately. <laughs> I, I think this is a better way of, of reading it. The book falls, I think, into two sections divided by the two, uh, two major sections. The, the two scrolls. In chapter five, there is, a, after four, I'm sorry, chapter four, there's a sealed scroll. And in chapter 10, there's an open scroll. And so scholars usually say, well, that may be a sign to the first half of the book is going to start opening the, 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 the revealed message. But it's going to be somewhat difficult, somewhat hard for us to grasp, where the second half of the book is more open. In the second half, the author explains himself more. Not absolutely clearly, but he'll come back and say, well, this stands for that. And that stands for this. The first half, you get no clues. You're on your own. Second half of the book, he's a little more helpful. So the closed scroll and the open scroll. All right? Some other characteristics of the book, literarily. It's, it has an anthological character. Anthological, anthological. What do I mean? The, the book never quotes the Old Testament. You know, remember Matthew? You know, this was completed to fulfill what the prophet said, blah, 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 blah. You never get a direct quote from the Old Testament. But there are more than 500 allusions. Allusions. An allusion is a reference, uh, a passing reference to the Old Testament. Especially the prophets. And especially of them, Isaiah, Zechariah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. So the author has been thoroughly soaked 
in the prophetical word. Now, in one sense, it's too bad we're not reading this after next year. <laughs> okay? um, but the, the, the author has totally absorbed the prophets. And so either his vision comes to him in those same words, or the vision is so beyond language, trying to describe it, he, he turns to the prophets to find the language to describe it. The, the image I think I used last time is the coloring box. Okay, 128 Crayola crayon, you know, with the, with, the, with the sharpener. His crayon box is the Old Testament prophets. But there's not a single direct quotation. But he's saying everything that the prophets were speaking about, I'm speaking about. Okay? Questions? I don't see God coming down anywhere in, in Revelation. God's intervention. Yes, God intervenes through the Spirit, through ain't, but 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 not Jesus. Jesus doesn't come to earth, other than the opening. The Spirit doesn't come to earth. It's angels. It's angels that are the mediators. Okay? God's in heaven. This, I, I think the vision that he's giving is that, yes, God's going to intervene and, and, and ultimately rechange things. In, I'll give, here's, the, here's, the, here's the conclusion. How does the Bible end? Like it starts. That is, in the end, heaven has come down to earth. The great wound, the great gap is healed. And so, in a sense, we go back to paradise. Paradise. So, so that's the ultimate goal. That in a sense, when evil is finally once and for all opposed, the end is like the beginning. Other comments or questions? Yes. You were talking about things being linear. Do you think that's a little bit less? Or do you more like overlapping things to build into something? No, again, I, I'm not proposing that. People who read Revelation as a prediction, the left, the left behind people, the the you know the Seventh Day Adventists, Jehovah Witnesses, they're linear. They're seeing the book as talking about any anybody who's predicted the end of the world. It, it, how many times has that happened in your lifetime? You're about some person who's you know that, that that's a linear view of history. It's going to go and then it's going to stop. I'm proposing following actually an ancient patristic writer, that the book is, is only, it's, it's about one event, but you, it's the same thing over and over and over. It's the same story over and over and over again. So you don't see that it's more of an accumulation of events? Nope. It's the same event. It's the same very simple event. God's going to finally get his order. Now, if you're a linear reader, that's how you would understand it. It's an accumulate, well, this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and, this, and then ultimately that happens. But again, uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm not comfortable with is it's, it's saying someday this is going to happen. And I'm saying, no, that's not what the Revelation's about. It's not someday this is going to happen. It's that this is how it is. This is how it is right now. And we need to be, what side do we need to be on? What side are we going to get on? So, I, I, again, I, I just I, I, I go back to Charles Miller. I'm so fascinated by him. I, I visited his farm, you know, and the Adventists have a little shrine there and a little museum there, and they really believe next week, next month, it's gonna it's gonna come to an end. And and I can see I see inspired truth in this book, but I don't see it as a countdown to a day when these things are gonna happen. One after another, after another, after another. It is about judgment. There will be judgment. 
God controls the reins of history. There should be no doubt about it. Regardless how bad things are now, how, regardless how, how you suffer, not to worry. In the end, God will be triumphant. Stephen. There, there's really no connection, <laughs> really. <laughs> I mean, as a church, we kind of, we blend them. But there's nothing in Revelation that speaks about G Jesus. He's, he's, he comes, to, there's, this, there's this war, there's this, this conflict. But it's, it's kind of hard to bring the two together. We have done that in our theology. But I'm not sure that the author of Revelation had ever read the Gospels. I mean, he knew the Gospel stories, but he didn't, you know, this is... A different, a different understand. And again, <laughs> yes, they share in common there will be an end to history and there will be judgment. So to that degree, it is linear. But the book itself is not, first on Monday this happens, and then on Tuesday that happens, and then on Thursday that happens. It's just, it's just that basic plot line is much simpler. There is evil in the world. God will confront that evil. God will defeat the evil. God will bring wholeness and harmony on earth as in heaven. All right? Let's start reading. It's a very long book, isn't it? Yes. Look at the opening verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants what must soon take place, and he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice how many levels of, of, tra of um, passing on there is. This is what God gave to Jesus, who gave to an angel, to give to John, to give to us. What does that say about God? He's far removed. He's very far away. The author of John has an utterly transcendent picture of God. That explains partly why the world's such a mess. God is big and far away. And, and, and the earth is a mess. And there's all these levels in apocalyptic, there's frequently, when you, if you go to heaven, there's lots of like levels and stages and passwords you need. Uh, so apocalyptic comes from an environment that sees God as utterly transcendent and far away. Look at verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Again, when you hear Asia, don't think Japan or China. Think Western Turkey. Okay, It's a province of the Roman Empire. And the seven churches, the number seven appears 54 times. It's a, it's a favorite number. It's a kind of a round number. Why is it a round number? Well, there were seven astronomers in that age would point to seven things that move. Sun, the moon, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter. They didn't see, they couldn't, you know. So, I mean, it's six, maybe Saturn. So, they, they and, and so in, 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 Many ancient cultures, seven is kind of seven days of the week, another example. So seven is kind of seen as a, perf a perfect or full or complete. You and I might not, we may, we may not want a hundred or ten or a thousand, but for the Bible, seven is a key, a key element. Huh? And numbers that are that are fractions of seven. Okay, so what is six? Six is one less than seven. It's frustrated fullness. Seven is full. Six is not quite there. And what's three and a half? It's half of seven. And th this number, this focus on seven, by the way, comes, is, is found in the book of Daniel. Okay? Daniel, the book of Daniel, which we'll read again if you're with us in a year or two. Daniel is respond, it's apocalyptic. Repon re responding to a this-worldly crisis, 100 and 
67 years before Jesus' birth, the leader, the, those who ruled over Palestine, wanted Judas to give up their faith. And so they, they persecuted Judaism. They closed the temple. They forbade Jewish families to circumcise their boys. Okay? And if you did, they would kill you. Okay? Now, the book of Daniel and the books of Maccabees are about that. And we'll get there. But there was a period in which the temple was not in their control. That is, not in Jewish people's control. It was in the control of these other, these Greek Hellenized Jews. And how long was that? Three and a half years. So three and a half becomes an image for the time when evil rules. Now, don't take it, now in, in, in Maccabees, it really was three and a half years. But the number in Revelation, I would propose, doesn't mean three and a half years. It just means the period when the baddies are in charge. Okay? Because it's just lifted from, from Daniel. Okay? It's just lifted from Daniel. And so it's also called a time and half a time and two times. Okay? Those, are all, those are all ways of saying the same thing. So it's the period of suffering. The period, you know, it, it, like with COVID, to know that, there's a, you know, in, in, our, in our city we have a, the city's got a res resolution, we have to wear masks until the end of the month. But knowing there's going to be an end, you know, you can hang on. If, if, you know, if, 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 if things, a tough things going on, think of, think of uh, school. Oh, God, three more weeks. Okay. Just if you know there's going to be an end, it's e it's easier to hang on. Two weeks for you before you retire, huh? Three weeks. Okay. So knowing there's going to be an end helps, and so the author uses that image of three and a half from Daniel to talk about the time of trial. Okay. It's the time when the, when evil is pulling the strings. Okay. Verse 8. So John, he, he, it opens like a letter. Huh? He greets the people and he talks about, um, uh, a, he gives a greeting, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was. In verse 8, the vo a voice says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That will reappear in, in chapter 21. But here it's God who says it. In the end, it will be Jesus who says it. Okay? Because, here's another key thing, the author has a very high sense of, of Christology. That what he says about God the Father is equally said of Jesus the Son. In chapter 4, God, Yahweh, is pictured on a throne and guess what? In chapter that's four. Chapter five, it's the Lamb who has a throne. In chapter four, they all praise the one on the throne, and, and then chapter five, they're all over again. What we say of God the Father, we say of Jesus the Son. Now we take that for granted because we we profess the Nicene Creed, but in the first century, it wasn't quite so clear. the The author here is speaking about the identity of the Son with the Father. Okay. This yellow hand, this yellow sheet, pull this out if you got it, please. But flip it over. J John, the he, in verse nine, he says, "I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the tribulation and the kingdom, and patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos." He, he implies that he's on Patmos because he was he is he's there. Maybe he's exiled there, or he's in some kind of imprisonment there because of his testimony into Christ. Huh? And on the Lord's day, in verse 10, he, he is praising God and then he hears a voice that says, write what you... Well, first he hears a trumpet and the and a voice saying, write what you see in a book. And he turns around and he's got a vision. What you have on this page is the vision that John the seer has of Christ. And what I've done is, on the left-hand side, in bold, there are certain words. 
that correspond to, I told you, the author is just filled with the visions of the Old Testament. So on the right, you see where that imagery is you. It's quite a, a, a mix. Daniel, Zechariah, maybe Daniel, though. So I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. And back in Zechariah chapter 4, there's a vision of seven lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. Well, we've seen son of man as a title for Jesus in the Gospels. But remember, it really comes from Daniel 7. Wearing an ankle-length robe with a gold sash around his chest. Well, later on, you're going to see there's a vision of, uh, well, across the page, Daniel 10.3. Daniel, visited by an angel. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed with linen, whose loins were girded with gold. Okay? Verse 14. The hair of the he on his head was as white as white wool or as snow. In chapter 7, verse 9 of Daniel, uh, the, Daniel has a vision of God who cannot be described, huh? Remember, no one sees the face of God and lives in the Old Testament. But Daniel goes so far as to say the Ancient One, seated on the throne, had hair that was just brilliantly white. And so does Christ in the vision of Revelation. His feet were like polished brass, refined in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing water. Uh, chapter 10 of Daniel. The angel's face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, the sound of his words like the noise of a multitude. In his right hand, back to the left column, in his right hand he held seven stars, a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth, his face shone like the sun at its brightest. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then Daniel, in chapter 8 and chapter 10, Daniel is not visited by God, He's visited by an angel. But in both cases, he falls flat on his face. I present this to, to you just to get you what I meant earlier by saying there's more than 500 allusions to the Old Testament, where John the seer tells his vision using the Crayola crayons of the prophets. And here's a primary example of that. That's the only purpose of this handout. Okay. So the Christ appears to John with a message for the churches, and he says, write them down. And so chapters 2 and 3 are the messages to the seven churches. I invited you to take last time one of these, and if you, ha you didn't have to do it, but I said you might find it interesting if you keep track of what does Christ tell John to tell the churches? What kind of troubles are they facing? And are they internal troubles or are they external troubles? And give them a grade. Now, we're not going to hand this in. This was just a device to get you to read with attention. Um, and notice each of the letters has the same structure. The, the, the angel or the messenger of a particular church community is addressed. Uh, Christ speaks some, oh, there's, there's also a reference to some element from that original vision of Christ when he appears to the seer. Jesus either, or the Lord either praises them or condemns them. He gives them a threat and then a promise. And then there's a final, a final you know, keep your ear, let, let he who has ears to hear, hear. So each of the letters has the same shape. I'm going to invite just, if you will, uh, we're not going to read them, but I want you to give me your feedback. And then we'll, maybe we'll go back to kind of ground, you know, the, the text. The first church is Ephesus. Ephesus was the great city. It was the seaport. Uh, several hundred thousand people. It's a wonderful place to visit uh, if you're into archaeology. So, uh, who wants to tackle this? Who wants to give me what they discovered, if they were able to do it? Again, nobody had to do it, but did anybody do this and want to speak about the Ephesian church? What kind of troubles are they facing? Yes, Joanne. False teaching and they lack love. False teaching and they lack love. The author speaks about self-styled apostles. Those who say, hey, I'm an apostle, listen to me. 
it, they make mention of the Nicolaitans. Now, we don't know what, who that is, really. People make stuff up. Well, Nicolaitans must have been teaching. We don't know who the Nicolaitans are. So, um, but, and would you, how would you grade the, any, any external troubles, Joanne? Well, I put it down there, Nicolaitans. Yeah, uh, my guess is they're internal. But just a guess. You might be right, too. And anything good to say about them? That wasn't on the list here, but this thing about love, you know, you know, but they, that that they they hard they work hard, they persevere. So so the author, or the, I'm sorry, the narrator has good things to say. Would you grade them? What would you grade them as a teacher? A C. A C. Ooh, tough grader. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you get get the point. They their problems are internal within the church. There are false teachers. And their love has cooled. Their initial love. We all know that's like. We get excited about something, you know, a person or maybe a sport, and we buy a lot of equipment, and then it sits in, a, it sits in our garage, or, you know, um, it, you know we, we let, first the enthusiasm has been lost. Okay, Smyrna. Who can speak to that? Peter. Affliction and poverty, even though they're rich, is an eternal, internal threat. You think it's eternal because... Okay, they're thinking that they're poor. Right. But he says, no, 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 you're really rich. Okay, so that you, under, you understood it, that they have a bad self-image. I think the author is saying they feel like they're harassed, but God is very pleased with them. Ah. He's very pleased with them. Because they have, what kind of threats are they facing? Persecution from the Jews. The Jews. The Jews who are slandering them. And there's some talk about prison. Okay? Now, that's not an internal church thing. I don't I, I can't send my prisoners to prison. I might like to, but I can't do that. But that's that's an external governmental thing. So I would argue Smyrna is being persecuted. They're feeling a little persecution. So how would you grade them, Peter? I gave them a I did positive and negative. I yeah. gave them a positive grade. Okay, I, I think you're right. Okay, it's me because it's it's all they get is you know they they have troubles, but they're external troubles. They're not internal troubles. Pergamum. Who wants to tackle that one? Jerry? Oh, no. Was she, she who? <laughs> um, Cecilia B. DeMille. <laughs> oh. Keep going. Is it time to quit? Two minutes. Two minutes. Real quick, right now. Take a stop. Take a break. Okay. We'll come back.